So it's your last time coming to the Reno Air Races. Maybe it's your first time gonna be out there, or maybe you've been out there before, but it's been a while. I decided to put together this whole guide to kind of give you an idea of what goes on at the races and how to kind of maximize your time. And I'll tell you, it took me almost two years to figure out how all the scoring worked. So we're gonna talk about that at the end. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody for the massive response for the last video. Whether you're the guy who wanted to go and see Reno and always had it on his bucket list but never got around to it, or maybe you're one of those guys who got to see the very first Reno 60 years ago and are coming back to kind of bookend this era of aviation. I just want to thank every single one of you for all the amazing comments you guys made and uh, all, all the incredible support. And uh, I hope to see a lot of you guys out at Reno this year, which is really why I wanted to make this video. The first couple years I went to Reno, I didn't really have a good guide of what to expect or what to see or how to kind of optimize my time at Reno. So I kind of wanted to give you guys that in video form here. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the Reno Air Races don't actually take place inside Reno. They take place out at Reno Stead. Now, there's no hotels out in Reno Stead and oftentimes there's no Airbnbs. If there are any Airbnbs, they're generally all snapped up by now. There is RV parking out at the Reno Stead Airport, but those spots tend to get picked up really quickly. So if you're not already booked in, chances are you might not even get a spot. That means your best bet's gonna be to find a hotel out in Reno. And there's a few really good hotels where you can go to. If you're looking for kind of the classiest hotel around there, it's the uh, GSR. It's a really nice hotel. I've only been to it once, but uh, it's kind of the, the high end standard out there, but it is very expensive. The Nugget is also a really good option and that's where a lot of the sport class guys stay. But to me, the actual best hotels in the area are actually at the Row and that's the Circus Circus, El Dorado and Silver Legacy. It's three hotels that are kind of mashed together with a full promenade in the middle of them so that you don't even have to go outside between them. There's a ton of hotel rooms in those three hotels. So you're pretty much guaranteed a room. And there's a lot of really good places to go at night, whether that's for food or entertainment, uh, which is kind of important because Reno is in a kind of depressed area. Uh, it's gotten a lot better since Tesla moved their Gigafactory in there, but uh, it can get fairly sketchy at night. So if you're looking for a hotel in the Reno area, I would generally stay away from the motels or kind of the smaller hotels that don't have a lot of amenities inside them. Uh, because then if you have to walk around at night, uh, it can be um, a little bit dangerous. So just kind of keep that in your mind when, when booking something there. But that means you're still about eight miles away from the show. So uh, getting back and forth can be a bit of a challenge there. There are shuttle buses that go back and forth and they stop at certain places. Like the row has a shuttle bus that comes back and forth about every 20 minutes, which is a really good option. Uh, the Nugget has one that stops off every hour, but there are some other ones as well. And just check into those ones uh, from the other various hotels. It is close enough that Uber will get you back and forth to it. The other good option is to rent a car, which is usually what I do. Uh, but parking isn't really a, too much of an issue at the Reno uh, races there anyways. So you're generally okay for, for driving a car in. Now, if you're a pilot, which most of you probably are, and you wanna fly into Reno, unfortunately, there's not really good options to fly into the races. At the Reno State Airport, there's nowhere to park at all. Uh, there is no itinerant traffic at all allowed at the Reno State Airport during the race event. Uh, you can get in there the week before, but they're gonna kick you out during the races. Uh, there is just no place to park. So instead, if you're flying in, then your best option is gonna be the main Reno airport. There are some other airports in the area like Carson City, but generally speaking, flying in, uh, kind of your best bet's gonna be the actual Reno Tahoe Airport. Uh, they don't charge too much per day, just give them a call, and uh, it's not too terribly expensive to, to park at their FBO outside. Uh, that's where I parked last year and they, they took really good care of me. So now once you're actually inside the race grounds, it's kind of split up amongst uh, the general attendance and then the pit area. Uh, the general attendance area is, is typically where all the stands are. So if you're looking for a place to sit down in the stands or maybe buy some food or buy some merchandise, um, then that's kind of a, gonna be your best bet. Uh, if you see these guys wandering around in orange shirts, these are the uh, section three guys. They are the super fans of Reno. We always, uh, we always like seeing them walk around. They're always coming around getting photos. Uh, you can't miss them. They're the loudest people around, uh, both in what they're wearing and what they're yelling. Uh, just off to the left of the stands is the chairman's tent and uh, this is a uh, kind of a premium buffet uh, uh, lunch breakfast uh, venue uh, where you can go in. Uh, it's usually fairly expensive to get into but uh, that's going to be your best bet to get uh, a really nice meal. Uh, there are a lot of other food amenities around in the area. Uh, one thing that you have to try is the pulled pork parfait. Uh, it's uh, mashed potatoes and pulled pork and gravy all in this this plastic container and it is, um, 
It's something you can't miss when you go to Reno at least once. In front of the stands is the box seats. Now these are um, more expensive seats. Uh, you buy them as box se sections. Those are a little bit more expensive, but if you're looking for kind of that more premium experience, then that's, that's a really good option as well. Uh, off to the right of the stands is when we start getting into the pits. And over on the right hand side is where the jet pits and the stole drag pits are. And you can go over and see the jet class aircraft over there. And you can also see the Stoll Drag aircraft over there and meet some of the pilots. Now off to the left of the grandstands is where you get into the main pit area. And this is where I generally find all the most interesting things always happening over there. So past the VIP pits is gonna be your Unlimiteds. And that's your, your P-51s, uh, your, uh, your, your Bearcats, all these kind of you know, World War II aircraft. Uh, this is where they, they park all these and some of them race there uh, but uh, most of them race there uh, but sometimes there's also some static displays there uh, honda usually puts a honda jet uh, parked out there as well and, uh, and a bunch of other aircraft uh, cub crafters is often around trying to sell uh, sell their uh, their carbon cubs over there as well beyond that is the t6s and these are you know your harvards your t6s depending on depending on which country you come from uh, past the T6s is where your sport class starts coming in, and that's going to be your RVs, your uh, Lancer Legacies, uh, your Glass Airs, all these really fast, really, really fast sport class home-built aircraft. Um, they're going almost the same kind of speeds that you're going to see the Unlimited guys going at, not quite the speeds the Jets go at, but they're, they're going really fast. So these guys are pushing really hard. Now the last pits that you can't miss are actually all the way down at the very end. So if you go all the way to the west end of the field until you can't go any further and hang a left, you'll get over to the IF-1 biplane pits. And that's that's where we're always parked. Now if you see a race pilot walking around, you can always go and ask them for their autograph. Most of them are more than happy to get a photo or get their autograph taken or even just say hi. But be a little bit cognizant of what's going on as, as well. Uh, for example, if they're getting ready to get out there on the racetrack, uh, they'll have their fireproof suit on, um, you know, they'll be pulling the plane out. Uh, don't go and bother them. They're kind of in race mode. They're getting ready to go and fly. Um, and the same thing when they're coming back. Usually they have to do a debrief right after each race. So just kind of give them a bit of time, a little bit of space. But outside of that, a lot of the race pilots, almost all the race pilots are more than happy to get their photos taken, their autographs taken, and, uh, and very happy to, to be approached and talked to. Uh, ask them about their airplane. Ask them what's special about their airplane. Some of them will even tell you. Now I mentioned merchandise earlier, which you can find kind of in the main stands area. And Reno does sell some, some fairly decent merch, but I found that the best merch you can get, whether that's, you know, t-shirts or whatnot, is oftentimes down over in the actual race pits. So some of the, some of the teams have some really, really nice merchandise. I know IF1 has had some really nice merchandise for the past few years here. So when you're walking around to the pits, which I absolutely recommend getting a pit pass, it's absolutely worth it. Uh, when you're walking around in the pits, ask if they got merch and see what they have and, uh, and get some from them because it really helps support a lot of these teams. A lot of these guys can't make it to Reno without some kind of external support such as merchandising. So, All right, now for the big topic, which is scoring in Reno. How does it actually work? Uh, most people are kind of used to the idea of a standard race where, you know, you come in first place and that's first place overall. Uh, but Reno has this kind of weird tiered system, and that's because they're not allowed to put more than uh, eight planes on the course at once. Some classes only do six on the course at once. So they have to do some very weird scoring, and every single class is a little bit different. So we're gonna kind of go through from IF-1 first all the way up to the Unlimiteds and, and Jet class. Now, IF-1 biplanes are the only classes that actually does a standing start. So IF-1 starts at eight planes sitting on the runway in a stationary position at the beginning of every race. They all start their engines a few minutes in advance and run them all up, make sure they're all good to go. And then the flag bearers, they drop the flag at exactly, exactly the start time. And all the planes take off in, in, in basically at the same time. Uh, this can become fairly challenging. It can become fairly dangerous in certain situations. You might've seen some footage from Steve Senegal or some other pilots as well, where they had a collision on the actual starting grid in Reno. Uh, once they're off the ground, they do eight laps around the track and uh, they cross over the start finish line right in front of the home pylon. Uh, if somebody is a lap behind, which definitely happens a lot, uh, then they uh, don't have to do that last lap. In fact, they're not supposed to do that last lap. They're all supposed to pull off the, the course. 
Uh, biplane is very similar. They have a very similar type of start, start setup, except they only have six planes on the grid. And they start them in kind of a staggered way so that their timing actually starts in the flag drop. So you might actually see somebody who looks like they're in like fourth or third place, but they're actually in first place because they've caught up that much to the row in front of them. And they do that kind of for spacing and for safety reasons, and especially because biplanes have probably the worst visibility of any of the aircraft out there. Now, most of the classes do what's called an air start, where they, they start flying up in the air, and T6s is no exception to that. So T6s will all take off in series, just kind of a standard takeoff, and then they'll all go join up six abreast across behind a uh, pace plane. And the pace plane is usually, usually it's another T6, sometimes it's a different aircraft. And they go and do this big sweeping formation, and then they come down the chute, and then you'll hear on the radio, and they'll, they'll call it out on the announcing system, they'll say, And then the pace plane pitches off, and all the other planes go down and continue on their race. And uh, that, that kind of gives them the spacing they need, because some of those planes are a little bit faster, so they'll end up getting the first turn before the other guys. And again, they do all their laps, and same thing for the final, final lap. If they're a lap behind, they don't have to do that, that final lap. They're just considered a lap behind. Now T6 also does have a second way that they can do a start, uh, partially because of how many pilots there are and how many racers there are. They'll often do a drag race where they uh, can kind of eliminate a few people without having to do a full race. And they'll take two planes, start them right on the beginning of the runway, and they drop a flag and they go down for one complete lap. So they take off and then they go around the lap, go around the track, and then the first person across the finish line moves ahead, the second person doesn't move ahead in the, in the race, they're eliminated. So the unlimited class, the jet class, and the sport class all kind of do a, a very similar type of start to the T6s. They all take off and they all form up behind a pace plane, and then they go back around the backside of Peavine Mountain, which is a, a much wider turn, and then they come down the chute towards a guide pylon, which is just past the first pylon and then they kind of work themselves in that way. So instead of coming from the very west side, they come back from the south side towards the racetrack. And it's, aside from that, it's a very similar type of start. It does mean that the very first lap is always a very, very fast lap because they're basically uh, diving for the course uh, right off that, uh, that start there. Now all the tracks are a little bit different sizes. So Formula One and Biplane, they all have a smaller oval track. The T6s and sort of the bronze medallion uh, sport class, they have a, a kind of a shorter track. And then the unlimiteds and, and faster jets and, and the faster sport class, they have a, a much, much wider course. And what this means is that in each class, each lap is about a minute, kind of give or take. And that kind of keeps racing fairly, uh, fairly interesting for the uh, actual spectators, but it also means that they're not pulling as many G's. So you can imagine if a jet was trying to pull around a very short course like the, the IF-1 guys were doing, uh, they would have uh, substantially higher G's and a much substantially uh, increased chance of blacking out during a, during a turn. So, so they kind of keep the tracks matched with the, actual, with the actual racers. Now, when it comes to the actual scoring of it, uh, early in the week, they all start out doing qualifiers. And the qualifiers are usually about one plane on the track at once. Sometimes there's multiple planes on the track, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's a very small number of planes on the track. And they'll call out on the radio that they want to start the clock, and then they'll do two laps around, and then they'll get the faster of those two laps. And that becomes their qualifying time. And from there, they, they kind of rank them where they should be in the hierarchy order. So if they are you know, in the first the top eight people, top eight racers, they'll go into the gold class. The second, they'll go into the uh, into the silver class, the third, bronze class, and then anything below that is a medallion, if there's a medallion. Now, once they start racing, which is usually kind of midweek, kind of Wednesday-ish, uh, they start doing their heat races. And the heat races are kind of where the scoring gets a little bit weird. So if you are in, say, the silver class, and you come in first place in the silver class, what you can do is you can either stay, say, I'm gonna stay in the silver class and continue racing down here, and I'm gonna be in basically the first or second place the entire time. Or you can say, I wanna move up to the gold class now. And if you move up to the gold class, you bump down the bottom person in the, in the gold class down into the silver class. 
And what that means is that you can have these situations where two people are trading back and forth between gold and silver until the very last race. And some, sometimes people wanna be you know, at the bottom of gold, sometimes people wanna be at the top of silver. So um, it kinda depends on the individual racer, what they wanna do, and they can opt in and out of that. Then at the end of the weekend, Saturday, Sunday is when we actually have the final races and that actually solidifies their, their final position. So if they win in gold, then they, they're kind of the overall champion there. Uh, but you also see guys where you'll, you'll see first place silver, first place bronze, and that's because that's the position they ended up at the final race in the silver or bronze classes. So when you're seeing those weird, like they're silver, but they're first place, what's going on? I don't understand. That's, that's what's happening there is they're, they're moving them around. Now, once you win a race, whether that's a heat race or a final race, you get to do a ride in a fire engine. So there's this fire engine that rides up and down the stands and you'll see everyone cheering and, and uh, yelling at these people. And they're the guys who won the previous race. So uh, you'll see whether it's a Formula One or biplane or jet or whatever, when they win that race, they'll go run over to the the fire engine and the fire engine drives them up and down, wailing at siren and everybody takes pictures and, and yells and whatnot. So uh, it's, it's a big honor for a lot of these racers to go and to go and get to do that. So that's my guide for the Reno Air Races. Unfortunately, as I said, this is going to be the last one. So you are going to want to get your tickets sooner than later. Uh, I know a lot of us are buying tickets already. Um, sometimes there's hotel discounts. Sometimes they're not available yet. Uh, we're going to be ordering uh, our, our hotel rooms already. Uh, regardless because we want to make sure we're not going to be uh, without a without a spot um, I'm going to be around probably doing press again so I'm going to be walking around my camera so if you do see me come over and say hi and uh, I hope to see you guys all out there and enjoying the races and if you haven't already seen it I've got a link over here for why the races are ending and uh, see you next time